Hello, my name is Neville Hogan and I'm the director of the Newman Laboratory for Biomechanics and Human Rehabilitation in the MIT Mechanical Engineering Department. And I'd like to tell you today about some work we've been doing on trying to uh, perform some uh, surprisingly difficult measurements of human balanced uh, performance. So we've been looking at the measurement of human motor behavior in a particular context. Part of the reason that I'm be, we've been doing this is that I've had a long-standing interest in developing technology to help people recover after neurological or orthopedic injury. And one of the reasons that this is important is because here I can show you the demographics of the United States population in 1960, and again, projected out to 2060. And I think it's obvious what the major change is, and that is there's a lot more people who are what would normally be considered elderly. Now, of course, this is a good thing. People are living longer and they have fuller lives as a result. But at the same time, uh, as you age, you become more vulnerable to diseases such as cardiovascular accident, stroke, other things like that, or even just normal aging. And that generates a need that I think we need to, we should address. And I've been interested in developing technology that I have come to call therapeutic mechatronics. And here's an example of it. The idea is to take mechanical, electrical, and information technology and configure them in such a way as to help people with problems that they may have. What I'm showing you here is some work we've done in developing robotic tools to help people recover their upper extremity function after a stroke. And this actually is now a commercial product and it's uh, reasonably successful. What we've been doing more recently is targeting balance disorders. And of course, the reason for this, I think, should be quite obvious. Elders disproportionately exhibit balance disorders. And even more important, that balance that falls that reduce for, that result from falls that result from balance disorders can be fatal in some cases. For example, if an elderly woman should fall, she is likely to break her hip. If she breaks her hip, that may compromise her ability to move around. That may in turn compromise her cardiovascular conditioning, and that may in turn compromise her overall health, and you wind up with a downward spiral that can result in death. This is, this is not a, a trivial matter. So the goal of the work that we're doing, the broad goal, is to develop mechatronic technology to see if we can treat balance disorders, or if not, maybe we can compensate for them in some way. Now, a key part of the story, though, is that we know from previous work that the key to success is to be able to understand and understand quantitatively the dynamics and neural control of the thing that we're interested in helping, in this case, upright balance. Well, uh, the challenge here is how do you measure the dynamics of upright balance? Now, I'm sure we're all familiar with the fact that if we think at the quantum level, that uh, measurement fundamentally disrupts the thing that you're measuring. And that's, I believe, well established. However, we have the same problem when we look at measurements at the mesoscale level of centimeters to meters. That is, when you measure what's going on with a human, you're very likely to perturb it. The, uh, the key problem is that uh, humans are supremely adaptive. Now, the conventional approach to identifying a dynamic system is to apply perturbations observe the consequences, and then use some of the many uh, mathematical tools that are available to figure out the details of the operation between the applied input perturbations and the observed outputs. The problem is that because of the supreme adaptability of humans, as you perturb them, you're gonna change their balance strategy. And it's actually fairly obvious if you think about it. If you walk up to a quietly standing uh, human standing upright, and you perturb them, they're likely to assume a slightly crouched posture. Well, that's a different balance strategy. That's not the one that we want to measure. So the question then is, is it possible to identify unperturbed balance dynamics in human subjects? And here I think that the answer is, will lie in the fact, uh, another key observation about humans, and that is human, the human neuromotor system is fundamentally noisy. That is, we can't actually stand still. When you're standing upright, the center of pressure between your feet and the ground is actually meandering around, meandering around as though it was uh, going through a random process. 
The process might not actually be random. It may result from chaotic nonlinear dynamics, but it doesn't matter. It looks like it's a random process. So can we capitalize on that neuromotor noise to help identify the dynamic system? And uh, the answer is yes. So the way we go about this is that we assume a model of what we know reasonably well. And in this case, that's the gravito-inertial dynamics of upright posture. We know the length and shape of the limbs. We can uh, come up with good estimates of the mass distribution and inertial properties of the limbs. We know where gravity points. So that part we've got pretty much uh, well, well under, uh, under control. What we then use is the intrinsic data variation to identify or infer the controller parameters. And we've shown at least in simulation that this can work very well. Of course, there's a snag and that is it depends upon the structure of the model that we use. But as I'll show you, it turns out we can address that problem based on analysis. So let me show you what we've done. This here is an example of some recent work published by a colleague at the University of Wisconsin, Craig Grubin and his colleagues. So the, uh, the thing is that postural stability implies that there's gotta be a correlated variation of the origin of the ground force vector and the orientation of the ground force vector. And that's depicted here in, the, in, in this panel. So if you take two adjacent time slices of the observed force vector, they will in general intersect at, at a point which is called the intersection point. Turns out that if you analyze the variation of that intersection point in the frequency domain, you get this very interesting pattern. So at very low frequencies, you find that the intersection point lies above the center of mass. And to some extent that makes good mechanical sense. If you can imagine the intersection point above the center of mass, that's equivalent to suspending the body from that intersection point. And of course that will then be intrinsically stable. At the same time, what uh, Grubin and colleagues have shown is that if you go up to higher frequencies, here we're talking about three to eight Hertz, that the intersection point lies below the center of mass. And that's consistent with correlating forces and moments about the joints to compensate for at least a second order mode of behavior. So we set out to see if we could, in fact, first of all, describe this behavior, and secondly, use it to identify something about the neural control strategy that results in this behavior. And so the first thing is that we can establish the minimal model order just by looking at the data. It's very common in studies of uh, uh, human upright balance to assume that the body can be described as a single degree of freedom inverted pendulum, and that's not unreasonable. However, it cannot describe the intersection point below the center of mass at high frequencies, which we find in these data. And that's something that we've shown. Turns out that the simplest model that's competent to describe this behavior has to have two degrees of freedom, a two degree of freedom inferred a pendulum with this, uh, the first link representing the legs between the ankle and the hip and the second link representing the body above the hip. Uh, if we do that, we can then use that as a model to describe the data and extract from the data the parameters of, of a controller. Turns out that a minimum effort control model is remarkably competent. So here I'm showing you, these are the human data that I showed you a couple of slides ago. Here's the data from simulations that we have developed and they're very similar. And in fact, here over on the right, I'm showing you the, sup the superimposition of the human and simulation data right on top of each other. And to, not to, but to find a point on it, we nailed it. Basically, we've clearly been able to reproduce the human the experimental observations of human data. Now, there are a couple of important uh, details here. As I mentioned before, we assumed a two degree of freedom inverted pendulum model, and I can justify that. But we also assumed a linearized model with full state feedback, and that I probably need to explain. So the basic controller was assumed that the controller was linear and it was based on position and velocity feedback from each joint. The joints in particular here are the ankle and the hip. That controller is equivalent to assuming that we have an apparent multivariable stiffness and damping about each joint. And that's gonna be true for any controller no matter what its final, its internal details are. We also added motor noise to each of these degrees of freedom because we need the noise to reproduce the stochasticity of the behavior. 
The key point though, is that we used the linear quadratic regulator procedure to identify controller gains. We use that for one key reason, and that is that we know that human upright behavior is stable. The linear quadratic control regulator guarantees to give you a stable controller. Secondly, it has some very important properties. One of them is that if you go to minimum effort, the minimum effort behavior is completely insensitive to the details of how you design the controller. So you wind up with the same basic behavior no matter what you put into the controller. In practice, what we did is we assume that the penalty, here we have a quadratic penalty trading off deviations of state from deviations of control effort. We assumed an identity matrix for the, for the uh, state weighting matrix. And we wrote the control weighting matrix to separate out this parameter alpha, which penalizes the overall control effort, and parameter beta, which uh, relatively weights the ankle and the hip. We also added in another a third parameter, which weights the noise ratio in the ankle and hip. So we take those and look at the, uh, the effect of them. And of course, the first result we see is that over here in the top left, if we assume a relatively low value of alpha, which means that we're going to allow the system to use a lot of control effort, we wind up with the intersection point above the center of mass at low frequencies, below at high frequencies, but the pattern of variation is very different from what you see experimentally. On the other hand, if you penalize the uh, control effort, that is use them the least possible, you get a very accurate description of the behavior. And going from an alpha of 10 to the four to the 10 to the six makes essentially no difference. We then looked at, assuming that value of alpha, we looked at variations of the parameter beta, that's the relative weighting of hip and ankle. And you see that that makes a difference somewhere in this region, this gray shaded region where the difference between the uh, intersection point and the center of mass height are not statistically significant. Here, what we find is that the best uh, ratio is obtained from a value that uses the ankle more than the, than the hip. Over at the at top right here, we've looked at the uh, relative noise level. Now, there's an important detail here, and that is because of the extremely long time delays in the human neuromotor control system, they can be 100 milliseconds or maybe up to 300, depending on whose papers you read, that th th this is clearly not being achieved by real-time feedback control. The, the, the delays are too great. However, the intrinsic properties of the muscles can operate essentially instantaneously. So here, what we've been able to show is that if we use the noise per parameter, which is the a parameter of the muscle itself, and we adjust it, we can get a good fit at the high frequencies. So the basic story here is that the general trend of how the intersection point varies with frequency appears to reflect just biomechanics. However, the specific details of how the intersection point varies with frequency clearly do reflect neural control pr uh, priorities. And the important thing here is that minimal control effort yields the, yields the best fit. So I think we can learn quite a lot about human motor control just from uh, observations of humans standing quietly. And this might have a potential clinical uh, uh, application for example, the instrumentation to get these data, it's quite simple, it can be made relatively cheap, and it might be something that could be used in a doctor's office or a therapy clinic. And uh, let me stop at that point and um, thank my sponsors, many of them have supported this in other work. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>